la benvinguda a la primera conferencia magistral Jaume Sabartés a càrrec d'Elisabeth Caulin. Avui, el primer dijous després del nostre cinquantè primer aniversari de l'apertura del Museu Picasso, iniciem les conferències magistrals en honor al nostre fundador Jaume Sabartés, amic de Pablo Picasso des de 1899, així com el seu secretari des de 1935, Jaume Sabartés va treballar incansablement des de la dècada dels anys 50 per la creació d'un museu dedicat a Picasso a Barcelona. Aquell meravellós projecte es va realitzar amb l'ajuda d'un important esforç cívic barceloní. Després de 51 anys, continuem treballant per donar un millor coneixement i enteniment de l'obra de Picasso. Com a centre dedicat a ell, és de màxima importància per a nosaltres presentar nous estadis sobre l'artista. Aquestes conferències magistrals que tindran joc sempre els dijous després del nostre aniversari, el 9 de març, tenen com a objecte presentar el treball de recerca i estudi dels més importants experts picassians del món. Aquestes conferències tindran el seu espai i la seva presència dins el proper centre de referència picassiana a la web. En aquesta primera conferència comptem amb la valuosa participació d'Elisabeth Caulin. La doctora Caulin és base catedràtica de la Universitat d'Edimburg durant 30 anys. Les seves publicacions són alguns dels estudis més incisos sobre Picasso. Picasso Style and Meaning, del 2002, va obtenir el Apollo, el llibre de l'any del 2002, i així també guanyador del British Academy Book Prize del següent any. Interpreting Matisse Picasso, eh, publicat per la Tate el 2003, Visiting Picasso, The Notebooks and Letters of Roland Penrose, una figura que la doctora Caulin ha estudiat, ha estudiat eh, molt, de cerc, molt a prop, eh, publicat l'any 2006, també el llibre guanyador de l'any 2006, Apollo, i finalist del Bannister Fletcher Award del següent any 2007. Picasso, la sèrie Mujer tendida en la playa, publicat en l'any 2007 per el Museu Picasso Màlaga, i així com les exposicions que ha estat involucrat són també aportacions importants sobre el coneixement de Picasso en els últims anys. Amb Jennifer Mundi ha realitzat On Classic Ground, Picasso, Leger, De Quirico and the New Classicism, a la Tate, 1990. Amb John Golding, Picasso, Sculptor Painter, a la Tate, 1994. Amb John Ederfield, John Golding, Isabel Monon-Fontaine i Kirk Van Arto, Picasso, Matisse, a la Tate i al Museum of Modern Art, a l'any 2002-2003. Picasso, Late Sculpture, Woman, The Collection in Context, la escultura tardia, Mujer, la col·lección en contexto, al Museu Picasso Màlaga el 2009, i amb Richard Candal, Picasso davant de Gà, que hem tingut l'honor de tenir a aquestes sales el passatge any 2010-2011 que també es va presentar al Clark Art Institute de Williamstown. Ella ha escrit extensament sobre el moviment surrealista, naturalment sobre Picasso i especialment sobre els seus papiers colé, les seves escultures, el periòd neoclàssic, les fams d'Alger, entre altres. Actualment, ella treballa en el comissariat d'una mostra sobre el lloc de la caricatura dins els retrats de Picasso, 
per la National Portrait Gallery de Londres y aquí al Museo Picasso per el 2017, así como otros proyectos para el Metropolitan Museum of Art y el Museum of Modern Art de Nueva York. La seva conferencia de esta NIT está entre, estre, estretamente relacionada a el nuestro museo y la nuestra colección. Es un honor presentar a Elizabeth Cowlin, que disertará sobre la representación de Jaume Sabartés, el nuestro fundador, per Picasso en Querido Sabartés, Jaume Sabartés bis per Pablo Picasso. Y ahora Elizabeth Cowlin. Gracias, Liz. First of all, thank you very much indeed for all of you to come this evening and I'm absolutely honored and delighted to be here speaking in this wonderful museum which I first visited about 30 years ago, I think. <laughs> um, and in fact, I think the first time I ever read Sabartes's book, which I'm going to quote from a lot, was probably when I was about 20 years old and that's more years ago than I care to remember. But Thank you so much, Bernardo, for inviting me, and I would like to thank him and all his staff for the help they've given me in producing images for this lecture, showing me material in the library and the archive. Um, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you. So, Without more ado, and I apologize for doing this in English, but I know you've got a wonderful translator working here. Zabatez's devotion to Picasso is absolutely legendary. According to the dealer Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, who knew Picasso for almost as many years as Zabatez himself, to Sabotez, and I'm quoting, to Sabotez, there is not now, there never has been, and there never will be any painter but Picasso. This is not just the greatest painter of all time, but the only one, the unique. Sabotez himself never pretended otherwise. Commiserating with Roland Penrose, Picasso's equally besotted English biographer, he remarked ruefully, Ah, I see you too have caught the virus. I personally had no choice. I have suffered from it with pleasure all my life. In her score-settling memoirs, Françoise Gillot paints a tragicomic picture of Sabartes' sufferings as Picasso, in Picasso's service. She describes him as totally disinterested, but obstructive, jealous, baleful, the fixer of the studio at the Rue des Grands Augustins in Paris. And he was, she says, as devoted to Picasso as a Trappist monk to his god. The pair loved, uh, uh, shared a love of mystery, cloak and dagger secrecy, and they devised their own cryptic language and arcane rituals. But according to Gillot, Sabatez was a masochist who embraced the role of scapegoat and was repaid for all his efforts by constant ribbing, humiliating practical jokes, and a tiny stipend. Now, in this evening's lecture, I want to try and throw light on this lopsided and extraordinary relationship by concentrating on the images of Sabates by Picasso. But I wanted to begin by looking briefly at these inscriptions in two books that belong to Sabotez. <coughs> On the left, the cover and the flyleaf of Picasso's play, Le Désir Attrapé par la Queue, which was published in Paris in 1945. And on the right, the dedication in Sabotez's book from which I shall quote, um, <coughs> oh, sorry, in his book, Picasso Document Iconographique, which was published in Geneva in 1954. The warmth of, the affectionate warmth of these inscriptions is absolutely typical of the messages that Picasso sent to Sabates. And notice as well how thoughtfully each inscription has been composed, despite the appearance of careless haste in the handwriting. So, for example, in this one here, 
the JS of the monogram, right in the center of the page, of the cover, picks up the typography of the publisher, the Nouvelle Revue Française. And you notice how the date of the inscription here corresponds diagonally with the layout here. Or in this inscription, the letters A, A, the two words ami that are repeated, mon ami Sabartes, son ami Picasso, those two letters echo each other to indicate the bond between the two, between the, the artist and his friend. And on the other side, the inscription here has the form of a poem, and Picasso's handwriting is a contrast with the printing of the name um, on the, the, the flyleaf of the book. What we find, in fact, is that whenever Picasso communicated with Sabotez in text, and as we'll see in drawings and so on, he never dreamt of relaxing his aesthetic instinct. On the other hand, it could be said, sorry, it could be said that Gilo's assessment of the sort of sadomasochistic relationship between Picasso and Sabotez might seem to be confirmed by Picasso's many caricatures of Sabotez, which unremittingly and unsparingly focus on his short stature, his myopia, and his lack of conventional good looks. Sabotez himself is on record as saying, in Picasso's presence, I don't like my face, I detest looking at myself in a mirror, I have a horror of seeing myself in a photograph. That was reported by the photographer Brassai. Since he was so mortified by his looks, are caricatures like these acts of deliberate cruelty? especially coming, as they do, from the irresistibly seductive Picasso. And I'm going to be trying to address that question. What is the tone of caricatures like these? Now, Sabatez was exactly the same age as Picasso, as we've just heard. When they first met in Barcelona in 1899, they were just 18 years old, and Sabatez was training to be a sculptor, a sculptor at La Lotia while also compo composing poetry and prose. In his book of memoirs, Picasso, Portrait et Souvenir, he described the dramatic impact on him of that first life-changing meeting in the artist's tiny top floor studio here in Barcelona. And I'm going to quote quite often from this book. I still remember my leave taking. It was noon. My eyes were dazzled by what they had seen among his papers and sketchbooks. Picasso intensified my confusion with his fixed stare. On passing before him to go, I sketched a kind of obeisance, stunned as I was by his magical power, the power of a magi, possessing gifts so astonishingly full of hope and promise. Now, in this wonderful portrait, which of course belongs to the museum here by Picasso, the self-portrait, it gives us some sense of the charisma that transfixed Sabotes on that first meeting. And from that moment on, his belief in Picasso's genius was absolute, and his fidelity was absolute. Little by little, a friendship that accommodated their differences as well as their affinities began to develop between the bashful, awestruck young poet sculptor and his idol. On the left is Picasso's first portrait of him, but in the torn sheet of sketches on the right, I think Sabotez is the figure here, standing alongside the caricatural heads of El Greco and the famous inscription, Yo El Greco, um, the same features. Um, I'm pretty certain it's a portrait of him. Keen to gain Picasso's trust and regard, Sabotez was among those who helped him prepare and install an exhibition of his portrait drawings in the Quatre Gats Tavern in early February 1900. The purpose was not only to launch Picasso's career, but also to rival the sellout exhibition of portraits by Ramon Casas, which had been held the previous October at the Sala Pares, the foremost gallery in Barcelona. 
because nobody involved had any money and because in any case the point was to mock the affluent bourgeoisie who patronized Cassas, the drawings were crudely tacked, unmounted, unframed, and in no particular order onto the tavern walls. Among them was the portrait of Sabates. But I'm comparing it with two of the other drawings that were exhibited of an unknown man and of Santiago Roussignol. And compared to those drawings, the Sabotes portrait seems especially casual, with black charcoal lines scrawled across his knee to indicate where the composition would have ended, and only the most rudimentary suggestions of a farmhouse and landscape in the background. It's particularly free and casual. And so, although there is nothing intrinsically caricatural about it, if anything, it's perhaps a little idealized. It seems to me, um, it's a good likeness, it seems to me the intention was to show up the glib suavete of typical drawings by Cassas that you see on the right. And this parade of insouciance on Picasso's part has a sort of satirical motive underlying it, which would have been appreciated by the visitors to the tavern at the time. The other early portrait Picasso made of Sabotes is a deliberate caricature and one that works on two levels. Sabotes described how it came about. Picasso handed me a brush and asked me to serve as a model. Hold this with two fingers as if it were a flower. Lift it up a bit, like that, hold it, that's fine. I looked over his shoulder and understood. It was his commentary on the mania for effeteness which pervaded the atmosphere. The brush had become a lily. In fact, I think it's not a lily, but an iris, but never mind. The general target of Picasso's satirical humor was, <coughs> as Sabotez realized, the Art Nouveau style that was fashionable in avant-garde circles at the turn of the century, especially here in Barcelona the vogue for decadent themes in contemporary literature, and the pervasive cult of mysticism, of dreamy otherworldliness, and nature worship. Although he was himself affected by these currents, Picasso delighted in poking fun at um, Catalan modernism and the decadent poets, as these two um, drawings on the right show you. The caricature of a sort of generalized aesthete type of 1900, and the very amusing um, caricature of Pera Romeo um, in a field of irises um, done in 1900. The portrait of Sabotez is a more elaborate spoof than either of those, but it's of the same order. But Picasso's second target was, of course, Sabotez himself, garbed in the black cloak and the floppy bow tie of fellow bohemian aesthetes and poets, garlanded like bridesmaid and crowned with the burning lamp of enlightenment. But the mockery in this drawing is much less extreme, much more gentle than in these two contemporary sketches of a, a sort of a modernista here, and of these grotesque figures with lamps in their hair, just like the lamp that Sabotez wears. So in comparison, they are grotesques. Sabotez is not. Now, if we compare it with the straight portrait, the lifelike portrait um, that preceded it, we see that Picasso was true to Sabotez's distinctive features, his spectacles, his mop of lank blank, black hair, his long pointed nose, his prominent, rather feminine lips, his narrow jutting chin, and his delicate frame. And this is confirmed by the unflattering but surely accurate portrait of Sabotez that Carlos Valenti painted in Guatemala a decade later. The features are really very similar, as you see. Picasso's sense of likeness is acute. 
Picasso stressed these physical traits in the drawing on the left in order to reinforce the, the satirical message conveyed by the absurd costume and the garland, the iris, the symbolic lakeside background, the floating crosses. And the result is a caricature both of an individual and also of a type. These contemporary drawings um, remind us that caricature was endemic in the Quatregats circle. Indeed, it was extremely popular as a genre, generally at the turn of the century, with whole magazines devoted to satire. <laughs> Sabotes would have expected to be the subject of humorous drawings, like Casagemus, like Mir, like Palares, and the rest who you see in these drawings by Picasso, contemporary drawings. The caricatures Picasso made of Sabotes many years later continued the tradition, and I think one reason why he did not take offense must have been that he understood that they were Picasso's way of perpetuating their youthful intimacy, perpetuating their youth, in fact, by denying that solemn, respectful behavior was necessary now that they had grown old. <coughs> Picasso's next portrait of Sabotes was painted in Paris in the autumn of 1901, and he said that it commemorated a particular episode. He was waiting for Picasso and Matteo de Soto at their favorite cafe, La Lorraine. I was alone and dreadfully bored. Before me upon the table's marble top stood a glass of beer. With my myopic eyes, I scrutinized the room, trying to penetrate the smoke-laden atmosphere. I was dejected, unable to distinguish my friends even when they appeared. As my gaze was lost in a vain effort to define the blurred outlines, my mind too wandered. Ideas crossed and recrossed my brain. Just as my desolation was keenest, Picasso appeared. Unwittingly, I was serving as a model for a picture. I fell like a fly into the trap of Picasso's stare. On entering Picasso's studio a few, year, few days later and being shown the canvas, and I'm quoting again, I was astonished to see myself just as he had surprised me in the cafe, in that passing moment of my journey through life. Here is the spectre of my solitude objectively seen. And he then went on to claim that the painting marked the beginning of Picasso's blue period, the first painting to be painted in this palette of blue. The impasto on the surface of the picture is so thick because it had to cover up an earlier image of a child. And the picture, which was done from memory, was clearly painted at high speed. But Sabotes had no doubt that it was his portrait, and Picasso pinpointed the physiognomic traits that I enumerated a moment ago. The floppy hair, the long, thin nose, the feminine projecting lips, the narrow, jutting chin, the slight body. For once, Sabotes was not wearing his spectacles, so he told Brassai. And this gave Picasso the idea of depicting him as a virtual blind man, groping at the tankard, and thus anticipating the iconography of touch in The Blind Man's Meal of 1903, the painting on the right, which is, of course, one of the most famous paintings of the blue period. But Sabotes is not only a blind man, he's also a melancholic, because his pose is based loosely on that of the protagonist in Diora's famous engraving, Melancholia. Introverted, shy, a pessimist, who was proud to share Picasso's theory, and again I'm quoting from Sabotes, art emanates from sadness and pain. Sadness lends itself to meditation, and grief is at the wellsprings of life. Somebody with those sorts of ideas was the perfect vehicle for the expression of melancholy. In several slightly earlier paintings, 
Picasso had explored this very theme in compositions where miserable huddled prostitutes and impoverished street performers numb their existential pain with alcohol. So the portrait of Sabotez is poised somewhere between a modern life genre scene, a depressed drinker in a bar, an allegory of melancholy, and the likeness of an individual. And in his much later portraits, Picasso would very often give um, the subject a dual character like this, a likeness with also a symbolic meaning. The next portrait, which you will know well, of course, because it's here in Barcelona, was done from life. Sabotez had found Picasso alone in his studio, bored, distracted, and unusually for him, doing nothing. To drive away his depression, he decided there and then to paint the portrait. He put a canvas on the easel, and he set straight to work. Sabotez remembered, and this is, I think, fascinating detail in the book, that Picasso stood to paint the portrait, whereas usually he sat on a low chair with the canvas propped on the lowest rung of the easel, claiming to find the discomfort stimulating. In adopting a conventional standing position with Sabotez at eye level, not far off facing him, Picasso set himself to produce a conventional head and shoulders portrait albeit in the somber, unnaturalistic palette of his latest work. And shortly afterwards, he painted himself in the same cold blue palette, wearing a similar heavy coat, but with the collar pulled up, the painting at top right. In both these portraits, in the portrait of Sabotez in the self-portrait, I think he was testing his ability to produce psychologically penetrating likenesses of the kind that he'd painted as a boy. And one of the paintings I particularly admire from his, his childhood, if you like, is the one here in Edinburgh, uh, in um, Barcelona, Aunt Paper of 1896, an extraordinary portrait. Um, and in a sense, he had given up doing that kind of psychologically penetrating portraiture in realism in favor of one vanguard style after another. This was a typical maneuver on Picasso's part the adoption of a new style, the blue style, or a new genre never involved the complete abandonment of a style or a genre mastered in the past, realism. And he liked to keep the old repertory in working order. The new portrait frankly recorded the quirks of Sabotez's physiognomy and his dress at the time but without really simplifying them for comic effect, as he did in the slightly later caricatural group portrait made as a flyer for Els Quatre Gats. And I've made a, a detail of the Sabotez figure there, where you notice the face, the head, the hair, and so on. The costume is really very similar to this portrait here, but here it's treated seriously, if you like, not for laughs. But Picasso was not satisfied with recording his friend's appearance. He also wanted to suggest something about the essential man, his tastes and personality, without using any props or any suggestive background. And to do so, I think he presented Sabotez in terms of Spanish culture of the Golden Age, giving him the monkish look, which you find in austere, intimate portraits such as these two by Morales, and El Greco. The connection was fully justified because Sabotez was immersed in the visual arts and literature of Spain and identified with that tradition. So this was something Picasso knew. And I think you know, the, the simplicity, the, sim the relationship between these portraits and this, this painting here um, is, is quite intentional on Picasso's part. It has a sort of emblematic character. One final word about this portrait, the disfiguring damage to its surface here is the fault of the Baroque frame gilded in the antique style in which Pere Romeo clad the painting when on returning to Barcelona, Picasso left it at Els Quatre Gats rather than with Sabotez's family as he'd promised. And according to Sabotez, it followed Romeo 
his ill luck passing from hand to hand until finally Picasso was able to buy it back himself. And I think I'm showing you two caricatures of Romeo. Um, I think when you compare them with the portrait, you realize why he liked the painting so much and wanted to hang on to it. I think he probably saw himself in the pallid, long-haired, melancholy poet staring back at him through hooded eyes from the deep blue depths of the canvas, so that for him it became, in a sense, a, a sort of portrait, um, no longer just a portrait of Sabotez. There was a lapse of three years before Picasso painted his next portrait of Sabotez, but the circumstances were similar in that when he did so, he was in a bad temper, disgusted with his present circumstances, and actively planning a decisive move. In late 1901, when he painted the picture on the right, that had meant leaving Paris and returning to Barcelona. But this time, in the spring of 1904, it meant leaving Barcelona to settle definitively, as it happened, in Montmartre. The new portrait is also related to the earlier one in being a conventional head and shoulders study of the sitter who looks straight back at the artist or the spectator without expressing any transitory emotion. And it too was painted from life. Both artist and sitter must often have seen the earlier painting hanging in the tavern in Quattro Gats, and it can be no coincidence that the canvases are almost exactly the same size and share exactly the same composition. Evidently, the second was conceived with its predecessor in mind to register the significant changes, not only in Sabotez's appearance, but in his whole persona. So, the aesthetic page boy hairstyle, the droopy moustache, the buttoned up overcoat of the the earlier portrait has, have been ousted by a short back and sides haircut, an upward combed moustache, a necktie with a gold pin, and a smart jacket with a velvet collar. This Sabotez looks older. In fact, he was not even 23 at the time. He looks more respectable. He looks more bourgeois, less arty, and this time, Sabotez agreed to pose for the portrait on the understanding that he could walk away with the picture afterwards. It's dedicated him, to him in the top left-hand corner, um, and it accompanied him when he set off um, for his new life in Guatemala a few months later. The 1904 portrait is a public image of Sabotez, I think, like this contemporary photograph an image concerned with outward appearances rather than the inner soul or the character or tastes. And I think it imitates the manner of a professional portrait painter. I suspect it was not simply a farewell gift to Sabotez from Picasso, who was about to move to Paris, Sabotez planning his move to Guatemala, but it was also an occasion for Picasso to test his competence in objective portraiture. Of course, in 1904, taking commissions was, for portraits was still the best way of making a living as a painter. And Picasso may have reckoned on having to support himself in that way when he was in Paris. In fact, he didn't, but he may have thought of it at this a moment. In any case, the later portraits of Sabotez were never as neutral or as objective as this one. Many years would pass before Picasso and Sabotez were once again constantly in each other's company. Sabotez, as I've said, set sail for Guatemala in the summer of 1904, and he remained there except for a period in New York until 1927, when he was reunited briefly with Picasso in Paris. However, they kept in touch by letter, we don't know what those letters contain because there's a ban on reading Sabotez's private letters until 2018. But the turning point in their relationship came, as we heard earlier, in November 1935, 
when, at Picasso's request, Sabotes came to live with him at the Rue La Boissy in Paris as his companion, his confidant, his assistant, his secretary. It was a period of crisis for Picasso following the birth of Maya, his daughter by Marie Therese Valter, and the definitive collapse of his marriage to his first wife, Olga. For a time, writing replaced painting in Picasso, as Picasso's principal form of creative expression, and not the least of Sabotez's duties was to decipher and to type up the chaotic manuscripts of the surrealist texts that poured from Picasso's pen, all the while watching over the artist like a mother hen. The drawings of Sabotez that Picasso made came a few years after that, the beginning of that um, relationship. He described exactly the circumstances of this, the first of those drawings. On Christmas Eve 1938, he went to Rue La Boissie, where Picasso was in bed suffering from a severe attack of um, sciatica. I should say that this drawing and the next two that I will show you are both on, are on display in the museum at the moment. To pass the time while Picasso was suffering, they began discussing portraiture. And Sabotez confessed that he would love, and I'm quoting, to have my portrait done with ruffs, like those gentlemen of the 16th century, and with a plumed hat to cover up my bald head. Amused, Picasso immediately promised to paint a full-size portrait with a nude woman and a very lean dog by your side, a dog like Kazbek, who was Picasso's Afghan hound. Now, Sabotez was far too familiar with Picasso's flights of fantasy, most of which came to nothing, um, because he, he had too many ideas. He could never carry them all out. So he was very gratified to discover the next day after this conversation that in his absence, Picasso had made the drawing which corresponded to his whim. Such was Picasso's pressure with the pencil onto the cheap paper that it got almost torn in certain pe passages around here where he presses very hard. He was in bed doing it, of course. I'm comparing it with the type of Spanish formal portrait, of somebody with a ruff, with a hat, with a plume in it, that both Picasso and Sabotez must have been thinking about. Although Picasso would never have presumed to aspire to the rank of a prince, rather to that of the discreet, attentive Chamberlain. Um, so in that sense, the comparison is not apt. Two further drawings followed on December the 26th. In the first, Sabotez has been transformed into a monk, absorbed in pious meditation. So Françoise Gillot was not the only one to consider him a Trappist monkey. In the second drawing, Sabotes is once again a bereft gentleman, but without the plumed hat, he resembles a clown, a favorite tragic comic character of Picasso ever since the Rose period. Sabotes's features were so indelibly etched on Picasso's memory that he could reproduce them perfectly in Sabotes's absence, and these drawings were done from memory. Um, the changes in costume constitute subtly altered interpretations of his character, the monk, the Trappist monk, the clown, um, the sad clown. Sabotez claimed to like all three portraits equally well. As far as resemblance is concerned, I have nothing to object to, particularly since the second two rather flatter me. What intrigues me is how the original idea suggested by me was gradually transformed. From the second sketch on, Picasso seemed to have definitively abandoned it, but on looking over the last one, I sense his desire to please me by returning to my original proposal. Still, it is evident that he was tired of it by now, for all jokes end by being fatiguing. I think these comments are very revealing Sabotez did not object to being teased, as he was in all these drawings, partly because of the firmly established understanding and complicity between the two, 
and partly because he detected genuine affection, a desire to please him beneath the badinage. It was flattering to be the subject of Picasso's wit, to share jokes with him that involved play acting and coded illusions that nobody else could fathom. And it was pleasant to be given these records of the time spent together, because all these drawings were then given to Sabotez. And of course, to Sabotez, anything Picasso made was touched with his unique genius and therefore of great value. But from long experience, as that quote I've just given shows, he knew when Picasso had lost interest in a temporary diversion. All jokes end by being fatiguing, and he wisely expected nothing more substantial than these drawings. I think he knew perfectly well that he could never be an inspiration on a par with all the women who shared Picasso's life and who were often a thorn in Sabotez's side. In fact, there was a follow-up to this episode 10 months later when they were holed up in Royan, waiting in trepidation to see how the war between France and Germany would develop. And it took the form of this extraordinary portrait, which you all know here in the museum, which has exactly the same format as the two head and shoulder portraits I showed earlier from 1901 and 1904. But needless to say, this was not done from life, unlike them. And Sabotez describes his initial reaction to it. Picasso th thought I disliked it because I looked at it coldly, without any exclamation or protestation. Like a child who has done something naughty, he said, you don't like it? Why shouldn't I like it? Because I don't break forth into exclamations. You know quite well I'm not like that. Besides, the picture gives me many ideas, and it helps me to understand better what you've been doing recently. Now, I think we can sympathize with Sabotez's initial bemusement. None of the earlier portraits, including the drawing made on Christmas Day, 1938, had exhibited grotesque deformations. And gauging the tone of the painting was bound to be more troubling for him, its subject, than for a detached observer. Pic Sabotez knew that Picasso could be cruel, he could be ruthless. So was he being deliberately cruel on this occasion, mocking and abusing the man on whose self-denying labors he now utterly relied? For Sabotez, there was some comfort in the knowledge that his was not the only face to be treated in this way. Just the previous day, Marie-Thérèse Valter's mother had been the subject of a very amusing caricatural portrait. Um, and Sabotez knew that Picasso was very fond of the old lady and would not have done anything deliberately to hurt her. More to the point, many paintings of Marie-Thérèse Valter herself and of Dora Maar distorted their faces more or less monstrously by showing them from different angles simultaneously as if they were turning this way and that. And I'm showing a very distorted contemporary portrait of Dora Maar, um, which has the same sort of facial configuration, the idea of the figure moving in space. There was also comfort in the knowledge that Picasso found ugliness far more powerful and more interesting than conventional beauty because they'd had conversations on this very matter in Royan just before the portrait was painted. In short, Sabotez knew that Picasso had a larger aesthetic and expressive agenda and that he ought not to take the distortions personally. As he became accustomed to the painting, Sabartes came to the conclusion not only that, and I'm quoting, my portrait has truly all the characteristics of my physiognomy and only the most essential ones, his severe myopia, the curious form of his lips I've mentioned before that had always fascinated Picasso, his pointed nose, the jutting chin, and now the smooth, bald, domed head, 
but also he realized that it possessed a formal and coloristic harmony of great lyricism inspired by, appropriately, by Spanish painting of the Golden Age. And in this photograph taken by Dora Maar, just after the picture was executed, he holds the painting in front of him with the glimmer of a satisfied smile playing across his features. So, when some weeks later an acquaintance described the portrait as a caricature, Sabotez objected strongly. And I'm comparing it with an absolutely brilliant caricature made in 1955, many years later, which is very minimalist and which I think Sabotez would have agreed was a caricature. And I'm going to quote again. This is his reply to the person who'd accused him, uh, who said this was a caricature. A caricature is a kind of minimum portrait done with the avowed purpose of ridiculing a person, whereas a portrait is the maximum expression of a personality. The qualities of which the painter emphasizes by means of lines, colors, or both, as in this case, without, however, overlooking certain features which might seem ridiculous to anyone else, for no one is perfect. But when we are caught upon the canvas by a great artist, a real artist, we are surprised to find what he discovers and prefer to consider it a caricature. In other words, the truth is, is too tough. Sabotez, in this quotation, draws a crucial distinction between the caricature's, uh, car caricaturist's intention to ridicule versus the artist's intention to achieve a deeper, non-photographic kind of likeness. And he suggests that catching the likeness of someone in a maximum portrait involves identifying the very traits of physiognomy, physique, gesture, and dress that the caricaturist exaggerates for humorous or satirical purposes. I think this is a very shrewd assessment of the fundamentals of portraiture. And Picasso himself said as much when he remarked to Roland Penrose, all good portraits are in some degree caricatures. Nevertheless, it would be fair to say that Picasso dared to erode the boundary of decorum between the two genres, portraiture, caricature, in a way that few other painters have dared, and in the process created portraits that are disconcertingly unstable in their emotional impact on the viewer. I have found, for example, Looking at this portrait of Sabotez, sometimes it, it strikes me sometimes as purely comical, but at other times as touchingly sad. And I do wonder whether Picasso had Watteau's wonderful painting of a melancholic Gilles in mind when he painted it, as well as Spanish paintings like this El Greco. Um, that obviously lies behind it. So this idea of the, the melancholy, the tragic clown, if you like, the aspect of Sabotez's personality. Sabotez never got the full-length costume portrait that Picasso promised him. But it could be argued that Picasso obliquely fulfilled that promise years later in his numerous paintings of musketeers, accompanied by the nude women that he'd mischievously imagining consorting with Sabotez. And I'm just showing one example. The musketeers don't have Sabotez's features. They're sort of generic 17th century characters. But when he painted them in the 1960s, Picasso was an old man haunted by memories of his past and one often hears the echo of former preoccupations, and I do think there is an echo of the Sabotez portrait in, this, in these works. Sabotez completed the text of Picasso Portrait et Souvenir in 1942, but the war prevented its immediate publication. For the frontispiece of the English language edition, he chose Michel Sima's evocative photograph taken in the summer of 1946, this photograph here, of himself with Picasso in the Chateau Grimaldi in Antibes, where Picasso had painted, had been painting that summer. Between them, pinned on a board, are three new portraits of Sabotez 
as a bespectacled fawn playing panpipes. And two of them now belong to the museum here. That summer, the summer of 1946, was a period of relaxation and joy following the trauma of the war years, and a sense of fun per permeated everything Picasso created at the time. Arcadia was his constant reference point. These blithe, decorative pictures were Sabatez's reward for his discretion and efficiency throughout the occupation and during the immediate aftermath when Picasso was besieged by foreign journalists and a constant stream of friends, admirers, dealers, not to mention the changing core of mistresses. One of them is inscribed with the pen name Jacobus Sabatez, which he had used when they first met in 1899. Acknowledging his importance in, in his life, Sabatez's importance in Picasso's life, Picasso gave him a place in his make-believe Arcadia, just as Gillo was given a place in other compositions, such as La Joie de Vivre, you see Gillo here in the center of that painting. It was a great compliment to him to make him part of this kind of Arcadia, to do these portraits of him. The portraits that followed have a similar fantastical aspect, but they take the form of classic caricatures, immediately recognizable as sabotes, but ironic characterizations that are often, often laugh out loud funny. On the 26th of November, 1951, Picasso made four drawings of sabotes as a gorgeously dressed bullfighter. I'm showing you just three of them. In one, he is accompanied by a beautiful Maya, of course. Um, now, needless to say, Sabotez was not cut out for the heroics or the glamour of the bullfight. Indeed, he was not an aficionado, and he didn't join the hangers-on who, in a great blaze of publicity, accompanied Picasso to the corridor. The discrepancy, which only insiders would really fully grasp, between the real man and the imagined reincarnation is the source of the humor. So it's very pointed, this description of him as, as a torero. In other caricatures, Picasso toyed with references to the art of the past that he knew Sabotez would appreciate. Here, Sabotez is a brooding, cigar-smoking Olympian god attended by a voluptuous Bacanti. It's a comic spoof of a neoclassical painting, and I think he may, Picasso may have been thinking of David's painting in Brussels of Mars disarmed by Venus. There are quite a lot of sort of references that are picked up here. Um, the cigar reference is amusing because Sabatez was very keen on the cigars that were left in the studio um, in, in Paris by one of the American dealers. So there's a kind of reference, a direct reference to that. Um, here, in this colored chalk drawing, um, he, of course, imagines Sabartes as um, one of the sort of famous, one of the most famous of all Velasquez's um, equestrian portraits. Um, just a, a sort of perfect joke. Other caricatures refer to journeys that Sabotez undertook on Picasso's behalf. Here, in this one, we see him as an intrepid aviator bestriding an extraordinary flying machine whose wings appear to be sort of cardboard boxes, flying back to Paris, here you see the Eiffel Tower, of course, from Rome, where he had represented Picasso at the opening of his retrospective at the National Gallery of Modern Art in Rome. Picasso disliked traveling, <coughs> flying in particular, and he hardly ever attended his own retrospectives if traveling was involved. And so Sabatez played that part of the, his representative, as it were. In the second drawing, 
Sabotes travels on foot to Barcelona, dressed in traditional Catalan costume, bearing his suitcase on his shoulder and brandishing a fly swat. This journey, I think, was undertaken in connection with the then secret plan to set up a Picasso museum here. The drawing dates from 1956. The death of his wife in 1954 had left Sabotes so distraught that Picasso feared, or so he told Roland Penrose, that Zabartes might commit suicide. Overcoming the endless problems, not least those of a political origin, in bringing the museum project to fruition helped him cope with the bereavement and, and surmount his depression. And I think all these caricatures are benign, not cruel, um, affectionate, as affectionate as the dedications we saw at the very beginning of the lecture. And it's quite interesting, it seemed to me that when looking at the caricatures, at the numbers that were created, there seemed to be more done after the death of Sabartes' wife, um, making sure that the contact was kept. Of course, the best known of the numerous caricatures of the 1950s are those that involve graffiti-like additions to brightly colored pinups and advertisements featuring popular movie stars and models. Inscribed with friendly greetings, most were sent folded by post to Sabotes as a compensation for the fact that he saw Picasso much less frequently after the artist settled in Cannes with Jacqueline Rock in 1955. And you can see the folds here. Um, it would have fitted perfectly into an envelope. In all of these wonderfully amusing things, a lustful sabotez, sometimes fully clothed, sometimes naked, never without his spectacles, ogles and kisses the sexy women, a lustful Sabotes, sometimes fully clothed, sometimes naked, never without his spectacles, ogles and kisses the sexy women, and each time Picasso made the scenario divertingly different. This contemporary photograph um, taken by Jacqueline shows just how acute these dra drawings done from memory wear. They capture his, his features perfectly. But of course, Sabotes was no Don Juan himself, and he issued dire warnings when Picasso became entangled with yet another woman, always saying that it alludes, of course, to Picasso's protracted bout of identification with Velasquez <coughs> when he made the set of variations after Las Meninas in 1957, which are here in the museum. A grinning Picasso occupies Velasquez's place, while Sabotes, diagonally across from his alter ego, the Chamberlain, Philip IV's Chamberlain, acts the part of the enraptured visitor to the studio. The joke here is that Sabotes never went in for extravagant displays of enthusiasm. That performance was left to everyone else in the court of King, King Pablo. So again, it's a very, a joke which has a lot of subtlety in it. Now, a moment ago, and this is my last slide, I suggested that Sabotez welcomed the caricatures because they proved he was in Picasso's thoughts. So often in Picasso's thoughts, in fact, that making humorous drawings of him became a party piece for Picasso, who found excuses to make yet another variation on the theme, even when the recipient was not Sabotez himself. These dedications in copies of Sabotez's book, Portrait et Souvenir, um, are to, firstly, on the left, um, Edward Quinn, the photographer, and the second, in the middle, unfortunately, to an unidentified recipient. And there are examples of this phenomenon of making caricatures of Sabotez whenever there was an excuse. Although quickly executed, they aren't routine repetitions, for they accurately register the changes in Sabotez's appearance, 
his clothing, his looks. In 1962, he'd suffered a stroke that left him partially paralyzed. And the drawing in the center of the slide, this one here, um, candidly records the onset of old age. You see him in a very touching photograph with Jacqueline's daughter, Cathy Utin, um, approximately um, contemporary with this here. The interesting thing is that although they're candid, candidly realistic, if you like, in both drawings, especially the later of the two, Sabotes looks content. He looks even happy, smiling. The source of this unwanted cheerfulness was, of course, this museum, which opened at last in March 1963, um, just a few months before the drawing in the center was done. Not long before that, Brassai ran into Sabotes for the first time in a long time in Paris in an exhibition, and he was astounded by the change. This is what he writes. In spite of his serious illness, this Sabotes who stands before me is a man transformed, happy. This Picasso Museum in Barcelona is the result of his devotion, the official crowning of his life's work, his apotheosis. He talks as though he were consumed by a strange fever. Acutely sensitive as ever to the mood of his intimates, in this drawing, done in November 1963, Picasso encapsulated the change in the inner as well as the outer man. And in so doing, I think he produced one of the most tender of all his portraits of his most faithful and most trusted friend. Thank you. They're not getting any sound at the moment in the booth for the translation. Sorry. They can't, they're not getting the sound. Hola, hola, I'm Reps. Sí? Sí, sí, vale. Uh, I'm sorry, um, speak Catalan, not... It's, it's okay now. Okay, Sabartes is Catalan and Picasso too. Yes, no. Be because uh, <laughs> there are from uh, Spain uh, things around the world, Picasso is from the Malaga, but 
Picasso, the best uh, time of your life is Barcelona. Live in Barcelona, Barcelona, open the wall. Yes. Ah, sí, perdón, y parlo en català y tal. Uh, escolti una cosa, uh, uh, jo, jo crec que, que el senyor Jaume Sabartés ha sigut el millor amic del Picasso. El millor, uh, potser n'ha tingut d'altres, però ha sigut el que més l'ha influït. Però em penso, una pregunta una mica personal, no sé si vostè ho sabrà. Uh, el Jaume Sabartés potser en un moment donat, en un moment donat, era molt més que un amic, potser una, una musa, una musa, un amic uh, que de viatge un amic que va, que, que, va, que va sorgir en un moment donat i, 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 i a través de, del senyor Jaume Sabartés el, el Picasso va, va, va introduir, eh, o sigui, va, es va identificar i es va consolidar com un artista perquè tenia una persona al costat que li feia molt costat, que, li, que, li, que, 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 sí, que se sentia, amb, amb, la paraula potser seria i, amb, tranquil. El més important per un artista i més aquella època és la tranquil·litat, perquè clar, era molt convulsa a tots nivells, Picasso els, els primers viatges a París no va vendre no, i aquí tampoc, vull dir, venia poc, no, no era un... Eh, potser necessitava, i potser eh, el senyor Sabartés potser lo que era és un, 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 un pilar bàsic en, on, el, on el Picasso com a amic, perquè el Picasso era solitari, era un home bastant solitari, doncs com a amic es pogués eh, d'alguna manera apujar, no? Què, què opina vostè d'això? Ai... <laughs> Sorry. I think that what you're saying is very interesting. He certainly was a pillar. He was a support, definitely, for Picasso. And he has a very, very important role as well as his biographer, as one of the earliest biographers. Um, not only in Portrait et Souvenir, which is a wonderful book because it recounts his, the painting of the portraits of him, and in it only really deals with his experience of Picasso, the years that they spent together. Um, so it leaves out the whole period when he was in Guatemala, for example, and they were not seeing each other. Um, and he then follows it up with this wonderful book of documents, really the first person to seek out the birth certificate, all the information about the family of Picasso in Malaga and so on, um, the houses he lived in, and he produces this wonderful book of photographs, which is a resource for us all. So he contributes enormously, not only to Picasso's life, to making his life easier for him, enabling him to work, he's the factotum, um, but he is also contributing hugely to our knowledge of his work, not just through the introductions he wrote to exhibition catalogues and so on, but through contributing documents, sort of documenting this life of this major, as he called him, his majors. Um, whether he was a muse in quite the way you think, maybe he was. I mean, I'm suggesting that through all these drawings that he made in the 1950s, when they were not actually seeing each other all the time, Sabotez's visage, his face, his presence is there in Picasso's memory. And it's coming out in these drawings, which are records not only of what he looked like in, in the sort of memory, joking, but also um, very pointed because they remember certain things that have happened and certain things that Sabotez has done and certain things he hasn't done, like he hasn't been consorting with a lot of naked women. <laughs> so there are these sort of jokes. So I think you're right that he is very, very much in Picasso's thoughts. Um, and perhaps of all his male friends, perhaps the most important. I mean, there was also Palares, you know, who was very important and continued to see him um, <coughs> right the way through. They'd made friends again very early, even earlier. Um, I think they met in 97, even earlier. Um, and it continued right until the end. But these friendships were crucially important, particularly perhaps after Picasso took the decision never to return to Spain after the Civil War. He didn't go back to Spain, as I'm sure you know, for the last 40 years of his life. And the contact with somebody in Barcelona coming backwards and forwards, as Sabates was doing, was terribly important to him. 
Um, so yes, you know, it was a crucial relationship, one of the most important. Um, and I think the imagery is very interesting. But of course, it tends to be um, uh, less prominent than the imagery associated with all the women in Picasso's life. We're much more familiar with that. <laughs> but thank you for your, your comments. Uh, Lucy, uh, when as I, well, I will speak in Catalan. When uh, as posat las tres cartas que Picasso va enviar al Sabartés, que son lo que nosotros nombramos en composiciones humorísticas y que al museo oh, tenim deu, siempre habían estado, siempre, casi siempre habían estado uh, personajes desconeguts y ahora mica en mica es van identificant. Al tenir estas identificadas con personajes famosas, como la Esther Williams, Neil Adams y la Sissy Parker, Susie Parker, me em, em pregunto y me agradaría saber la teva opinión si es que so, es casualidad que Picasso tries a estas obras o si entra dins del joc que aportaba a Sabartés y que realmente se habían hablado de ellas y al fet de que siguin famosas al va última vez para fe a que es dibujets. <laughs> Well, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, it's a very interesting question, and I've been trying to find some of these ladies. I did find Susie Parker, um, who, whose name meant something to me, and I was able to find her. The internet is a wonderful source for this kind of thing. If you have a sort of idea, you can then follow it up. Um, I really don't know. I mean. Of course, Picasso was in the south of France, in Cannes, and the film festival was frightfully important. And the whole sort of occupation of, um, you know, the, the Cannes Film Festival every year, and the interest in the cinema, and the sort of fan magazines that were being pushed about, gave him a source material. Um, and he loved this kind of popular culture material. But whether these particular starlets and these particular women were of particular interest to either Sabotez himself or to Picasso, I really don't know. I mean, it, I mean, it's a very interesting question. We know that Picasso had been using this kind of popular imagery as a boy, you know, going right back, um, that he'd used postcards of film actresses and so on. Um, this has been studied quite a lot, so that and this was at a period when Sabotez knew him, um, right back at the turn of the century. So this kind of playing around with popular imagery was something that both of them you know, were aware of and shared. But I think it's a very interesting question. I can't, I can't really answer it. I can't. We know, too, of course, um, that Picasso was fascinated by the cinema, and he loved popular films. Um, one of his favorite films was the Bengal Lancers, <laughs> but it, he used to watch it on the television whenever he got the chance. But it, it doesn't have any of these stars in it. So I'm afraid I can't answer your question, but it's worth, it's worth tracking it. Um, if only we knew. <laughs> but what did amuse me was the idea that these, these things which you know, you'd get in a fan magazine um, you'd have the magazine about a film and there would be one of these colour photographs within it. This is an advertisement in a newspaper, but the one on the right would be the kind of thing that was actually put into the magazine and then you could take it out. Um, and the folds in it, I sort of measured the folds and you could see that it would just fit into an envelope. So it was being sent almost like a postcard. Um, to Sabotes with these kind of inscriptions and in this case cutting it out and making a, a, a sort of a, a sort of cut out from it. But I'm sorry I can't answer your question properly. <laughs> Miri, una petita cosa. Eh, jo em refereixo al primer retrat que he ensenyat, que jo em sembla que sí que és un giri, és, és un giri d'aquests blaus que es troben als marges dels camins, no? I, i a més amb... Sí, i a més a més penso que Picasso, que, que vivia la cultura catalana, potser pensava en aquella célebre frase que, d'anar amb el giri a la mà, no? Quan una persona és de bona fe...
Eh, que, sí, yo creo que es un, una flor que, que se troba fácilmente, ¿no?, los camps, que surge salvatge. Y aquí diem vas a llit y a la mano, ¿no?, cuando eres una, una, una persona de buena voluntad, de buena fe. Well, that's wonderful. I did not know. Thank you very much. I, I mean, Sabotes himself says it's, he says it is a lily. And I thought, being British, <laughs> it's not like the lilies I know, but that just shows you I'm being ignorant. Um, so I think... Sí, sí, son, son así de culo blau, sí, sí. Yeah, well, it's... It's fascinating. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. <laughs> Perhaps I just ask you. Espera que ya un y las presto. Why have you here? Perdón. Uh, me agradece no, una. The wrong way. Sorry. I'm going. <coughs> The one on the right, would you agree those are irises? Sí. Sí. Bueno. Ancara. La pregunta sí, yo pienso que es la mateixa flor lo que le ha cambiado el color, eh? que es el mateix de la camisa o de la americana. No, pero... ¿Cómo? Estas son siempre identificadas como irises. Flor de... Iris. Yo creo que no. I think that's a wonderful drawing. Ah, calla, no, 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 me he equivocado, no es la misma. Le quería hacer una pregunta de la personalidad de Sabartés y la relación con Picasso, que incluso aprovecha la frase que estaba diciendo de Lidi Lama, que la gran pregunta, pienso que todos los que nos van a leer el libro de Sabartés y muy a prop el libro de François Guillot, ¿fins a quin punt Sabartés, la seva misogénia, que pienso que se ha estudiado muy poco, representaría de la manera que él fa la capacidad de hacer desaparecer todas las dones de Picasso, que no son pocas, Fins i tot François Guillot té una imatge menys idíl·lica que la que tenim aquí a Barcelona, perquè és molt fàcil veure des de Barcelona, com deia aquest senyor, com Sabartés és molt nostre i tal, però si demà me'n vaig a Màlaga, doncs ja no el veig tan simpàtic. I més, tenint la compte que el senyor Sabartés, com diu inclús mai la seva filla, parla i descriu escenes en les que sembla que ell i Picasso estan sols en una casa que en realitat pululen la primera filla Maia, pulen les dues filles de François Guillot i un fotimer, amb perdó, expressió molt catalana, també de dones. I la pregunta és, gelosia, una misogènia poc estudiada de la vida misteriosa de Sabartés i fins a quin punt Sabartés va representar, com François Guillot explica en el seu llibre, una mica un problema per moltes de les companyes de Picasso. Per mi seria aquesta la gran pregunta i el gran misteri sobre Sabartés. Well, I think you're right. He writes the women out. He writes his own wife out. His wife was there in 1935 with him and he was absolutely devoted to his wife. Um, but she doesn't appear. And you're quite right. Scenes appear in, in his book as if he was alone. You never hear about Dora Maar. You don't hear about Marie-Thérèse Voltaire, who is there in, in the occupation period. I mean, it, it just after in Royaume. Um, I think there is a, a, a degree of jealousy in this, unquestionably. And for Sabotez, the women were a terrible distraction. I mean, he knew, and he does say that, that the women are essential to Picasso's art, but they're also a terrible distraction. They cause frightful complications because there's never just one of them. 
there is always another somewhere and another one coming. Um, so it's very complicated for him. Um, and he, you know, he has that, that sense of a sort of male community, of the male relationship, which was how his original relationship with Picasso started, with this group in the tavern, um, all male, really. Everyone has girlfriends, but the people who matter are all men. So it's that kind of um, grouping that he's, in a sense, wishing to kind of keep. But I think there may be something else. Um, I'm not really trying to dispute a kind of sort of writing women out of history that he does. I don't want to dispute that. But he does, uh, one of the things that I think where he may be right, in a way, is that we have now become completely obsessed with the women in Picasso's life. We interpret his work in relation to the women with whom he had love affairs. And I'm not trying to deny that these affairs were very important or that these women were not tremendous important influences on Picasso, that their collaboration, if you like, wasn't essential. But we make the, I think, we tend to make a mistake to see all those paintings as being just uniquely about these individual women. It's about them. Everything is about the relationship. And we forget the fact that what Picasso is doing is making art. And he is, in a sense, transcending just that relationship, creating something which is bigger than that. And maybe one of the things that Sabotez found tiresome was already the tendency that was already beginning to see Picasso's work in terms of personalities, in terms of um, being, in a sense, a sort of documentation of his life. I don't know if I'm explaining this very clearly, but I think maybe that's one of the reasons why he's kind of writing out the women. He doesn't want the sort of history of the work to be seen <coughs> simply in terms of um, relationships, love affairs. And in the recent writing, or the relatively recent writing about Picasso, I think this has become very exaggerated, in my view. It's become too much. Um, we tend to think we've understood everything if we can identify who the woman was, who we think lies behind a particular painting. So maybe that's what's going on. But I do think there is, there is jealousy too. He wants to be, he would like to be the muse. <laughs> and he's very aware of the fact that in the, in the years that he worked as the sort of confidant and secretary and so on, and the factotum, he enables Picasso to do so much that he wouldn't otherwise perhaps have been able to fulfill without that sort of buffer between him and the outside world. And of course, what happens later is that Jacqueline Picasso takes on that role. Um, they move to the south of France together. Sabotez becomes a little less important. He's in Paris, looking after the studio in Paris, going in every day, coming quite often to Cannes, doing all sorts of tasks for Picasso still. But the person who's sort of answering the letters, answering the telephone, stopping people coming to visit Picasso, keeping in the way, keeping everybody at bay increasingly is poor old Jacqueline. Um, and, you know, she becomes at the end very unpopular because she is the person who guards the master and protects him from the outside world in the way that Sabotez, in fact, had done. So it's an interesting um, parallel there <laughs> um, that, that she takes on his role, really, I think. Voldria saber, per curiositat, si es coneix el número de retratos i caricatures que li va arribar a fer. Of Sabotez, the number. Of Sabotez, sí, sí. I showed you all the oil paintings that I know of, all the paintings on canvas. I showed all of them, and they're not that many. In terms of caricatures, there are many, many more. Um, I showed you a handful of them. For example, the, the pinups. 
Um, there are 10 or a dozen here in the museum, and I showed you only four. I've, there are lots more of these caricatures, and, and what I was interested was, um, if I go to the last one I showed you, the last slide I showed you. Oops, here we are. These two, I found them on the internet. I just put his name into Google, <laughs> and they came up. Um, and the one in the center came up as for sale. And I thought, my goodness, you know, that's interesting. Um, so I think there may be many, many more in dedications of the books by Sabotez that Picasso would dedicate and give to friends. Um, very often when he gave a book and dedicated a book to somebody, he made a caricature of that person. I mean, Ronan Penrose, for example, received copies of books which had sort of caricatures of himself in them, made by Picasso. And Picasso, at the end of his life, started doing caricatures of Rembrandt constantly. And they were very often on the fly leaves or the title pages of books. That became a sort of, he, Rembrandt was an alter ego. But I think there may be many more of Sabotez that I don't know of. Um, I certainly found, oh, I don't know, 50, 60, probably more than that, actually. I'm sure many more, actually, than that. Um, but I can't give you an exact number. And, the, and, and I mean, in the letters that we have yet to read, what wealth may there be in them? Those letters that were written between 1904 and really onwards, um, the whole correspondence, I don't know it at all. I've never, I don't know how many letters there are or anything. Um, uh, that is going to be a treasure trove of information, I think. And it may be full of drawings, you know. <laughs> so come on 2018, that's when we can open it up. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Una última eh, pregunta. Si no ya mes, eh, fin del propio año, a la conferencia magistral Jaume Sabartés, eh, que ya sabeu, eh, será el primer dijous después del 9 de marzo de 2015. Fin del propio año y muchas gracias.